Hello, this is my first full Eye of the Serpent video that I am recording in my new house in San Antonio. And for this video, I'll be talking about some insights that I've gathered from a rereading of Yanantin and Masintin in the Andean World by Hilary S. Webb. This book came out in the year 2012, and I first discovered it while I was uh, teaching at the University of New Hampshire. And the author came to give a lecture on shamanism for, from both a personal experience and ethnographic fieldwork in various parts of Peru, specifically among the Quechua speakers of the Andes region of the country. And she also had an exhibition of, of photography at the art gallery at the university. So there were many different resources that she was uh, sharing that uh, were giving uh, the students and faculty uh, some new uh, ideas about the culture, the spirituality, and the worldview of the Runa, the Quechua speaking people of contemporary Peru. So in this uh, book, she is exploring the concept of yanantin, which comes from the verb yana, which has a, a sense of to assist, to help, to come into an alliance. And what's interesting is that this inflection is uh, uses the suffix intin, which is very interesting because in Quechua, the uh, intin suffix is a way of indicating that th these that that the, that the word it is modifying is in some way meant to be understood as a coherent whole, so that these various parts, they may have distinct categories and qualities, but they are also understood as being separate, distinct components of a greater reality, of a greater whole. One of the best examples of this is the Tawantin Suyu, which was the name of the Inca Empire. That this comes from the word tawa, which means four, and the intin suffix. So tawanti means the unity of the four kingdoms, the four parts of the Inca Empire. And that is a similar idea to Yanantin. This is about the duality of phenomena in the universe. This is about the complementarity of the dual forces that govern the cosmos, such as the male-female aspect, light and dark, life and death. And some of you may be thinking that this sounds a lot like the Aztec concept of Omeyot, the duality that was a foundation of Aztec philosophy. And I don't see the similarities between the Peruvian and Mexican ideas of duality as coincidental. I think that these are two especially well-explained examples of a much greater philosophy of Native American metaphysics that are found across the Americas. So. I will talk more about the audiences that I think this book should be especially good for. But for the purposes of this video, I'd like to talk about how I read this as from a chaos magic perspective. So what is chaos magic? This was a tradition that began to really take hold in the 1970s. And the principle of chaos magic is that your beliefs are the foundation to ritual power. It is the beliefs and the intentions that you put into the work that, uh, by which you uh, create a system that is effective because your mind makes it power. Your mind makes it happen. And I wanted to talk specifically about the five basic forms of magic that are uh, understood in the chaos magic tradition. I know that there are many other practices and traditions, but the part that interests me the most is the five basic models of magic that are understood in chaos magic. And that is because they, uh, these are very much an individual experience. These are, uh, it, it is by nature eclectic and personalized because the emphasis is on how you research the magic, how you experiment and experience with the various practices that could come from a variety of different sources. It is focusing on the things that work. They may come from different traditions. They may rely on different systems. They may uh, work with different models, but it, the uh, priority is Oh, how do these things work? Which work for you at a, an individual and personal level? The five major models of chaos magic are the information model, the spirit model, the energy model, the meta model, 
And for the, I'm saving for last the psychological model because I think that this one is the most foundational. This is the most important to Hillary Webb's own experience of understanding Yanantin through uh, this uh, through her fieldwork. She was uh, looking to uh, explore this philosophical principle by traveling to different parts of Peru and talking with a few major consultants. Some of them uh, she'd known very personally, such as Amado, who is one of her closest friends in in Peru, and. What happens is that she begins to understand through conversations with these uh, Peruvian consultants, as well as her own personal experiences of the uh, the ways by which the Quechua speakers um, understand their reality and the dual forces that shape it. So what I'm going to be doing is uh, give some particularly good examples of the five magical models and how they pertain to the insights and the ideas that Webb describes throughout this book. My understanding of the information model of chaos magic is that the universe is comprised of a network of information, very similar to the matrix in the sense of a framework that is made of data. And the, this also informs the ways by which humans can directly access knowledge, say by linking to the Akashic records or linking to uh, the ultimate frameworks of the universe in order to directly access knowledge from its source. And so it, I thought it was interesting that a few places in the book, the consultants talked about downloading information. And I thought, and I think that the reason they did that is because these consultants have had some experience with new age traditions. And so these, a new age, this exposure to new age knowledge has informed some of the ways by which they talk about their indigenous Peruvian traditions. So I, and I think it's interesting that they use this idea of downloading uh, just as a way of accessing in some places, the uh, idea of downloading is important to Hillary Webb because it is a way for her to directly experience the phenomenon of Yanantin. It is not simply a principle that can be learned through academic research in libraries. She has to go to the source. She has to talk to the people, but she has to have these experiences for herself. She has to travel to the sacred sites such as Chavin and Machu Picchu in order to have that experience of the sacred, that experience of the Yanantin principle in order to truly understand it. And this is the, these are the ways by which she downloads this information. Another important way by which she downloads information is through the consumption of wamucha. This is the San Pedro cactus that no grows in the deserts of northwest Peru. It is very well known in Peru because of its hallucinogenic qualities, which have given priests and shamans spiritual psychedelic experiences that connect them to the sacred. And there are at least two places in the book where a web goes on her own journey and goes through her own visions by consuming this cactus in the presence of her companions. And this is a way by which she too can download information and insight directly from the sacred foundation of the cosmos. I wanted to read one particular passage. This is the end of the Chaoping chapter on page 89. Reading that, comparing it to my own experience, I suddenly understood what Amado had meant during that first meeting when he told me I needed to, quote, download the information from the cosmos, unquote. Through an experience with San Pedro, I had become, quote unquote, united in conversation with the cosmos, not metaphorically, but at a very literal level. In this way, I had come to know Yanantin in a way that I could integrate it, even just a little, and that changed my psychological sense of myself in a truly profound way. So you can see that this direct experience of knowledge that came from consuming the Wamucha cactus, the San Pedro cactus, has changed her psychologically. And I'll return to this uh, point uh, in the uh, when we talk about the psychological model and how it affected Hillary Webb uh, throughout this work. The spirit model in chaos magic is the idea that spiritual non-corporeal entities such as gods, spirits, ghosts, ancestors, and other types of non-human intelligences uh, populate the cosmos. And there are ways by which the practitioner can engage with these beings. They can be invoked, they can be dealt with, they can be uh, appeased or maybe even banished if necessary. 
So this is based on the idea that these entities are real phenomena. These uh, actually exist in the universe. And to work magic in, uh, in the spirit model is to be aware of their presence and the proper relations with them. So this work has a, a few references here and there to some of the traditional indigenous beings of the Peruvian pantheon, such as the Apus, the spirit mountains, the, uh, the ancients, the ancestors that live in the wilderness. There are other uh, major uh, beings such as the uh, Inti, the, or the Taita Inti, the father son, and the Pachamama, the mother earth, which I actually talk about in more detail in my video on the Pacha as a concept in the Peruvian Andes. So this is occasionally referenced in the work, and it is not as uh, pronounced as the other models in this, uh, in this book, but it was important to notice there were places like, for example, in prayers where these uh, beings are directly addressed and they are being prayed to to help Hillary in, in, in guidance, especially the example of the uh, San Pedro um, cactus consumption. The companions are invoking these spirits in order to help guide her so that she has a safe and insightful experience of consuming the cactus. So there are a few places here and there in the work uh, that, where they recognize and at least acknowledge the presence of these uh, other beings. But it, again, it was not as, uh, as significant as the other models as I was reading it through the work. I would say that energy is the most significant model for of magic for re understanding this book. And that is because the consultants, uh, again, because of their new age exposure, uh, talk a lot about the ways by which energies converge within and around the human body. And I thought it was very interesting the ways by which they integrated these new age ideas of uh, energies and their flows and currents within and beyond the body and incorporated that, uh, adopting it to the indigenous ideas about the upper, middle and lower worlds, so these ideas of pacha. And what I found interesting about this energy-based model is that it relies on these three realms of Pacha and the human body as itself a microcosm of this uh, philosophical understanding of the upper, middle, and lower worlds. The, the human body is very much like that. And so are the energies that are associated with each of the realms. So you have the Hanach Pacha, which is the Pacha of the upper world. And this is the realm that is filled with light. This is the light energy that is called Sami. And this is the energy that enables communication, harmony, the ability to connect with other things in the world through the exchanges of energies that are called Aini. This is the ability to, for essences of different bodies to merge, to find their commonality, to find their communication, to uh, open the channels of exchange that are essential to ritual, essential to being in the world in proper harmony and dynamic flow with the rest of reality. So these are the Sami energies that are found in the upper realm of Hanach Pacha. By contrast, the Lower, the inner world is the Uku Pacha, and this is filled with Hucha energy. This is, um, Hucha can be translated as fault or sin, but in this case, it is about accumulations. It is, um, this has to do with grounding and stability. So it, in excess, it can be a, a very harmful um, a cause for illness, but if these Hucha energies of within and the Sami energies of above and beyond uh, are in proper balance, then the body is healthy. And these forces converge at the level of Kai Pacha, the here and now. And this is a very important uh, priority of ritual is to ensure that people are healthy because they have the proper balance, the equilibrium of these light and heavy energies within the body and also how these energies exchange and are circulated with the rest of the world in relation to the human body itself. A meta model in chaos magic is the awareness that magic itself is a relativity. It is its power and its efficacy is based on how you believe magic works. So whatever traditions, whatever models that you find the most powerful and effective are the ones that are going to work for you. So you are aware that this is a personal and relative condition. And so it is because of that freedom and that flexibility that your work is effective and powerful. Powerful. 
And I think that the most important examples of this meta model and, uh, in the uh, in the book come when we look at two examples of altars. The one of them is the Mesa model. And this photo is of an altar model that I shot at the Bruning Archaeological Museum in Lambayeque in northern Peru. You can see the arrangement of different uh, ritual uh, artifacts and uh, symbols that are coordinated on top of the tablecloth. And these are important to the healer or to the shaman, so because they have to be arranged in a certain way in order to align the energies of each of the items in an appropriate manner. Hilary Webb describes a similar altar arrangement in chapter four of this book, and she does so by talking about the uh, aspects that are associated with the left end of the table of this mesa. This is the Spanish word for the altar table. And on the left end are artifacts and ritual objects that are associated with personal will and ambition. On the far right part of the uh, table are pieces and um, and. and artifacts and, and instruments associated with the divine will, that the, the will that is beyond the person. So what a healer will have to do is find the way by which to bring these opposing forces into balance. And that is done at the, in the center of the altar table. These are the things, this is the uh, nexus at which the uh, energies and the powers that come from the ends of the left and the right are brought together for a proper balance. And this is, again, a foundation of Yanantin. It is about finding the balance, the equilibrium, the flow of energy that is important for proper well-being, both for the personal and as well as the environmental level. So this is the way by which the altar can create a space, a set of fields by which to manipulate these different symbols and their respective energies and powers and bring them into a kind of cohesion and complementarity that is good for the patient, that restores the patient to proper energetic flow. And so this is one of the really interesting places where this where the practitioner is drawing from the spirit model, the energy model, and manipulating the symbols in order to perform an effective ritual. One other place where Hilary Webb describes an altar is when she encounters the healer Doña Elena, who does a very interesting altar setup with coca leaves that she uses first for divination. She spreads out the coca leaves on top of a table and scans to look for alignments of energy as they are crisscrossing the, uh, based on the patterns of the leaves as they fall upon the altar. But what I found interesting is that this is not just an oracle by, that is based on reading leaves, but through this process, by reading the situation, she can also rearrange the leaves in order to change the outcome. So this is not simply an oracle, this is also a ritual instrument by which she can magically change the outcome by rearranging the elements and realigning the flows of energy upon the table as, as in order to create an effective healing. So this is both an oracle as well as a ritual space for Doña Elena to perform her healing and other forms of uh, ritual practice. So I thought this was a really fascinating example of the ways by which you can not only read a person's outcome, but you can also use that same, uh, um, that same oracle in order to change it for the better. And this was one of my favorite parts of the book because of the detail that uh, Webb gave to this practice. And I saved for last the psychological model of the chaos magic because this was the one that I found the most intrinsic and the most important for uh, Hillary Webb's uh, travels through Peru. Because the idea of the psychological model in chaos magic is how magical ritual affects you personally. How does it give you personal transformation for the better. And this could be through the use of symbols and rituals in order to transform your outlook, transform your uh, perceptions, even uh, change your emotional dispositions based on the ways by which you consciously, or some, in some cases even unconsciously, train your mind to work differently. And these uh, can be ways by which you can improve your psychological outcome you can and, and uh, your ability 
to engage with the world. So what I found throughout this work is that Hillary Webb is trying to wrestle with the idea of Yanantin as a foreign concept that is very different to her Western academic trained experience. And coming from an American background, coming to this very different understanding of the world and accepting the idea of complementarity, accepting parts of the psyche, parts of the soul that are otherwise uh, denigrated or suppressed in Western uh, psychology, and uh, or at least in popular Western culture. And whereas in the indigenous worldview, these are things to be at least accepted. It's very similar to the idea of shadow work in uh, many magical traditions, where you un accept the, that there are negative and selfish and animal aspects of the human condition that have to be at least understood and confronted. And these are brought into complementarity in the Andean worldview. So this is a very important transformation and progression that Hillary Webb documents throughout her account of experiencing the, these ideas and these philosophical uh, principles through this ethnographic study. And one of the best examples of this is when she describes a fern at the top of one of the peaks near the site of Machu Picchu. And what she does is she consumes the San Pedro cactus on top of one of the uh, mountains. And from this, she looks down at a fern and the fern becomes a, very much like an illa. An illa is the concept of an, a one object being an extension of a larger reality. So if you have a model of a llama, it, is, it could be an illa of the, the greater idea of llama-ness. So likewise, the fern could could be an Ilya as an exemplar, as an extension of the greater principle of fractal principles that shape the universe. The idea of how this one model, this one plant is an expression of a greater reality that is continually expanding and retracting based on the model of the fractal that is ever expounding outward and also infinitesimally going inward. So it is through these experiences she begins to understand her place in the cosmos and her acceptance of the dual energies as they are converging within her. This is the idea of the Pachakuti. This is the profound found transformation of your inner world, even though uh, this has also been used to describe uh, important historical moments in Peruvian history or in world history where everything changed on the turn of the Pacha, on, uh, like say, this, this profound moment of transformation and inversion. And, and these are ideas that are expressed through Pachacuti. She also explores the idea of the Tinkui, the a collision, the encounter of these dual forces as they occur within her. And this also becomes a part of her psychological transformation, her psychological evolution. And she concludes the book on this point. She says that she was able to undergo a personal transformation and uh, redefinition and finding peace with her reality and her life because of the experiences that she gathered through these various travels across Peru and her conversations with the experts and the consultants that she encountered along the way. One last example that I will give is another important psychological impression that Webb describes when she visits the site of Chavin. And this is one of the early civilizations of uh, ancient Peru. And it was a place that had many important um, architectural features, such as a massive U-shaped pyramid and even underground tunnels that uh, could have been related to the circulation of air or water in ancient times. There is one point where Webb describes her uh, walk through one of these um, archaeological uh, temples in order to encounter this massive, uh, slender being called the Lanzon. It is this, uh, this gargantuan, monstrous sculpture of this supernatural deity that is uh, combined from feline, human, and other animal parts that together create this 
powerful impression upon her, this, a, a, this encounter with something that is so otherworldly, that is such a bizarre amalgamation of the things that are supposed to be natural, these things that are supposed to have their own respective animals, are being somehow mystically converged into this supernatural creature that is kind of leering da uh, down upon her as she walks through this deep tunnel in one of the temples. And I thought that this was a very good example of the ways by which these symbols can come together in very powerful and profound ways in order to make a deep and lasting impression on the human psyche. As she describes in very colorful detail in her chapter on the Lanzon, this uh, figure in the depths of one of the temples of Chabin. And this is a nice way to conclude the video with a presentation of today's mask. Today's mask presents a set of tenon heads carved in stone by the Chavin of northern Peru. From as early as the first millennium BC, the Chavin civilization created works fusing human forms with animal features. These would have been implanted high upon temple stone walls, from which they leered outward with a prominent grin. I encountered these plaques at the Larco Museum in Lima, where they are displayed near the first hall, for the earliest cultures represented among the museum's works. Among these first expressions, indigenous Peruvian artists were already exploring the mystical synthesis of human and animal qualities, combinations deemed possible in the realms of the supernatural, the beyond. Such are the realities that the book Yanantin and Masintin in the Andean world invites the reader to contemplate. Through this video, I sought to show that the Runa, the indigenous Quechua speakers of the Andes, have a philosophical and ritual system open to chaos magic reading. Indeed, it is one of the rare examples of a spiritual tradition applicable to all five models of chaos magic, information, spirit, energy, meta, and mental. The only other culture I could compare to it is Tibet. I recommend Hilary Webb's book especially for readers interested in Peruvian culture or Native American spirituality. This is an authentic description of an indigenous concept of cosmic duality which I repeat begs for comparison to O Mayot in Aztec philosophy and similar principles in the Aboriginal Americas. And finally, this work will be of exceptional interest and relevance for scholars and practitioners curious about living non-Western esoteric and occult traditions. Please like, share, and subscribe for updates. Your Patreon support goes toward research, travel, and production. Thank you for watching, and good roads.